You're watching the New Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more conversations and articles, please visit the newstack.io. Now on with the show. Hi, Gara, the inventor and maintainer of open source Calico, delivers Calico Cloud, the next generation cloud service for Kubernetes security and observability. Hi, Gara, and the New Stack are under common control. Hey, it's another episode of the New Stack Makers, and today I am joined once again by Ratan Tipanini, who is the president and CEO at Tigera. Ratan, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me here. Good to see you again. Definitely great to see you. And this is the second part of a discussion that we had. And some of the topics that we discussed in our first discussion, we talked about how the workplace is changing quite a bit, how that's really forcing a whole new uh, move to the to cloud services. We're seeing the growth of cloud native applications in the process. But the question still remains about the approach to securing those cloud native applications. And how is that actually done? So how do you identify? How do you assess? How do you prioritize? How do you adapt to risks across the application? How are organizations really thinking about this from a technical perspective? And so, Ratan, I wanted to follow up. And maybe the first thing we can do is talk about... One theme that we really touched on, and that's related to web application firewalls. Now, we talked in February. And in February, we have, since February, we've had a number of vulnerabilities uh, uh, discovered. Uh, what has been your thinking about the evolution of, of WAF when you think about what we're seeing in the attack landscape and the preventative measures that companies are taking or not taking at all. Yep. So Alex, I think VAF has existed for a long time, for several decades. That technology has been very impactful in thwarting attacks at the application level. However, in the context of cloud native applications, there is a fundamental assumption of traditional VAF architecture that breaks down. And so there's a need to rethink how that layer of security should be applied. So more specifically, WAF was always applied, that security control was applied at the edge, uh, either in the cloud or through like CDM players. And that worked really well when you had a set of static applications and there was a concept of a perimeter. However, with cloud native applications, with a microservices distributed architecture, uh, you have to assume that uh, something inside your cluster has been compromised. So just sitting behind a, a VAF that's sitting in the edge doesn't give you adequate protection. You have to assume that every single microservice container is almost open to the internet, metaphorically speaking. Uh, so then the question really is, how do you apply VAF controls? And just to complicate things, these these, down, these uh, workloads happen to be dynamic, so you can't really statically program VAF controls around any specific uh, workload. So that's where, you know, uh, we feel architecturally that the VAF controls have to be workload-centric, where every individual workload has its own VAF, so to speak. And when an application or a container gets, when a microservice or container gets spun up, the VAF controls automatically get spun up around that. So that way, even if something inside your cluster is compromised, or if you're exposing some of the services to the internet, uh, it really doesn't matter because you're now protected by the VAF. And so that's a fundamental architectural change that is required. Now the additional benefits are with this type of an architecture, uh, 
uh, the VAF now has complete context around the application, uh, which is not feasible when the VAF is sitting at the edge or on the CDN. Uh, so, so that really is one of the fundamental changes that has to be uh, driven when deploying security for cloud native applications. So you have to rethink your architecture for the WAF and start to apply them, those security controls at the workload, and you need a workload-centric WAF. You need a workload-centric WAF. And there's lots of different types of workloads. So is that part of the re-architecture to consider those different types of workloads? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and again, you know, when you have a powerful orchestrator like Kubernetes, you know, spinning up these containers with these workloads, uh, you have to be able to think about to have controls in a similar way. It's programmatic. They, those get spun up dynamically uh, whenever a workload gets uh, spun up. So what are some of the fundamental differences that we see in WAF as it evolves? Yeah, I'd say, you know, uh, let me start with what remains the same, right? So if in terms of the basic, the security rules like the OWASP top 10 and a bunch of intelligence that's been built to catch some of the traditional application-centric attacks, the good news is I think a lot of those, a lot of that software, those libraries, those rule sets are still applicable. Right. So that's the good news. Right? You, you get to leverage all that stuff. But the difference is you have a non-trivial challenge now of how to actually operationalize deploying a workload-centric WAF. And that's, that's what has changed significantly, and it's very different. And uh, we're hearing from customers that the VAF solutions they've been relying on for the last decade or two are really ineffective uh, inside uh, Kubernetes uh, and microservices-based cloud-native applications. And they're, they're looking for something different because some of the VAF sitting on the edge, first they miss the context of the application, they're getting a lot of uh, false positives. And so, so that, that's not very helpful. And worse, they don't have complete uh, visibility to all the traffic that's coming into these uh, cloud native workloads. So those are the three big challenges we're hearing from customers. And architecturally, you just need to be able to think of a different way of deploying workload-centric graphs. And uh, you know, that, that's what we have done at Tagata. So I know that uh, you know the firewalls have changed considerably. Uh, that's clear. Um, it's not perimeter based anymore. Uh, but what about uh, what about detecting uh, anomalies and and issues? Uh, what uh, what attention do you have to put on the behavior? Um, you know that you see the behavior patterns that you see in the network. Um, how do you get beyond, uh, you know, practices that once were effective, such as uh, signatures? Right. And, you know, there's other uh, issues, too, you know, such as, you know, it once you, it seemed like you could trust any API, but, you know, now it's increasingly being uh, a subject of attack, uh, those APIs themselves. Yeah. So let me answer that in two parts. So the first part is, I mean, you're absolutely right. The game has changed. And let me start with a very simple example. If you think about vulnerability scanning to detect known vulnerabilities, uh, that was a pretty well understood problem and a pretty straightforward solution for traditional application architectures. However, with cloud native applications and also with the explosion of vulnerabilities, it's no longer sufficient to throw out a report that tells you about all the vulnerabilities in your system because that report is not actionable because what people who are operating these services are discovering is that the amount of time and effort it takes to remediate all these vulnerabilities is incredible, right? So what they're looking for is they're looking for some level of prioritization in terms of way to start. Which are the vulnerabilities that I need to first attack 
which are likely to cause the most amount of damage in your system. And so this is this is a fundamental change. So the rules of the game have changed. So the, the, the important challenge right now that customers are struggling with is, can you figure out the blast radius of a known vulnerability in the context of your system? It has to be contextual in your system. And you can only do that at runtime. And uh, then once you understand that, once you understand the blast radius and the criticality of some of the workloads that uh, maybe a potential vulnerability is actually impacting, it automatically gives you a sorted list of vulnerabilities that you have to manage. So that's the first part. The second part really is related to that. Understanding you know, the, the, the surface area and how you minimize the surface area of attacks is super critical because, again, in this world of cloud native applications, customers are discovering very quickly that trying to protect every single thing uh, when everything has access to everything else is an almost impossible task. So the higher order bit for them is to start with understanding how they re reduce the attack surface with a denial model and only allowing microservices which need to talk to other microservices to be able to talk to each other. So that is a very highly leveraged activity in a security control that can actually stop a lot of these attacks. Now the third part, which really coming to more specifically to your question is, after having all done, uh, done all that stuff, you're still you have to assume that you're still going to get attacked, uh, mostly because you know there's always the threat of an insider attack, and in that situation, you're looking for patterns of anomalous behavior, where there's unusual activity, maybe at the process level, at the file system level, uh, or maybe at the system call level. And you're looking to baseline what the standard behavior is, and you're looking for deviations from that behavior, and then trying to tease out some signals, which are indicators of either attack or indicators of compromise. And, and once again, you, know, you do have to lean on some level of machine learning to be able to do that. And, and just to add to that, maybe a simpler use case of that is to constantly be able to monitor at runtime for uh, known bad uh, hashes or files or binaries that are known to be bad, right? So, so the challenge is, is, is the, the good news is that, you know, in the security community, there's, there's a finite list that, you know, the community contributes to. We, we all know what that list of hashes are, of uh, bad files are. The challenge is how do you constantly monitor and recognize those hashes inside your system. And you have to be able to implement that security control, which is another layer of defense. So, so just to summarize, you know, this is, this is what I've just articulated is defense in depth. There's no single silver bullet. You have to be able to do multiple things to keep your application safe inside uh, modern cloud native architectures. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, uh, you know, perspective there. Uh, what is that forcing, you know, network providers to do? And you know, uh, because those those behavioral differences can be quite granular, uh, you know, and it to me it speaks to uh, the evolution of observability. No, you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. Now, in terms of the network providers or cloud providers. Uh, just given what you said, you captured it in your question. They're limited in what, what they can do because a lot of this is contextual and uh, it depends on your applications, your services. So some of these security solutions have to be specific to the workloads that you're deploying. So there's only so much I think the cloud players or the network providers can do. Uh, the onus is really shifting to uh, the companies and teams deploying these applications. And really, they're the ones uh, who have to go deploy these uh, solutions. Okay. Uh, and so how do you see observability evolving oh, yeah. then as, as a practice? Sure, yeah. So, sorry, I missed the second part of the question you asked earlier. On the observability, is very interesting, right? I, I think, 
we, th we tend to think about it is, first of all, if you look at the last 10 years, observability security have been two silos. And uh, I think last time we spoke, I talked about, um, you know, those two silos converging. And specifically, it's no longer sufficient to report on security incidents in isolation where you spit out a report of all the vulnerabilities or all the issues inside your system. Uh, you have to contextualize it. And so the contextualization, like as an example, in our case, uh, we have a dynamic service in third graph, which shows visually which services are talking to which of the services. It shows an aggregation of namespaces. It shows which services are actually talking out to services outside the cluster sitting on the internet or which services are accessing IPs and clusters of IPs. So there's a nice visual representation of what is happening inside the cluster. Uh, and it's like magic because, you know, as soon as it pops up, you know, people uh, actually get to first time understand what's actually happening inside the cluster. Now, if you start to overlay security information on top of that, it starts to become really meaningful for them because you can talk about a service, a shopping cart service that probably has a vulnerability, but then you can actually visually start to see which other microservices that shopping cart is actually talking to in the context of the dynamic service and threat craft. And when you do that, you automatically have a perspective on what the blast radius is for the vulnerability and based on which other microservices it's talking to, uh, you can then decide if the other workloads are mission critical or not. And if so, what mitigating action you take. Maybe you decide that uh, the blast radius uh, is pretty huge in terms of the impact to mission critical workloads and you need to actually put some remediation or mitigation in place as a short-term measure before you get some remediation. And you actually stop, you, you roll out some security controls to stop the flow of traffic to these other microservices from your shopping cart service uh, until you have a remediation, right? So that's a great example of how observability and security kind of work with each other. And once you roll out the security control, you can actually then visually see through your observability feature set whether the traffic indeed has stopped uh, going to these adjacent microservices. So that's a very simple example of how observability, security are starting to converge. And I think from a trajectory of where we feel the industry is going, all conversations about security will happen in the context of observability or something like a service graph. Uh, because without the context, just talking about absolute data about security is not as meaningful or as valuable to security analysts or to the people operating this infrastructure and applications. Mm. And so this is these are early times. What are some of the tool to tool development that you're seeing there's a need for? Or what and what are people relying on in the meantime? Yeah, I'd say, you know, there's there's quite a bit of complexity in what I've just described. I, I've articulated a pretty simple case. Yeah. But uh, in reality, when you have maybe hundreds of microservices running on thousands of containers across multiple clusters, uh, the amount of, you know, the data in what some, a human has to process is pretty staggering. And even if you have the best visibility tools, it can still cause an, cause an information overload. So, so a couple of things, you know, one is we refer to it as a lean back experience where we try and take the burden away from the user and try to do a lot of the inference ourselves and present conclusions to users of what they can, what they should be doing. So, so that's a huge opportunity for innovation over the next decade. Uh, what we refer so to by, as a, and the, and the, that is in terms of the inference. Correct, exactly. And is that inference? Um, I've I've heard a lot of discussion about inference at the edge, for instance. Um, but we're talking about inference on just the overall network, correct? 
Uh, the, yeah, and, and the microservices running inside the right. network and how they're talking to each other, the potential impact, then indicators of compromise or indicators of attack. So inferences on any of these dimensions are very powerful. And the second related concept to that is, uh, so you discovered something, and uh, but it could take a significant amount of time to remediate it. Because remember, that the, the practical aspects of remediation are you've got to go back to the source of the software, the developer, get... Uh, how to fix it and come back and test the fix and roll it out. That could take days, weeks, or months, right? Who knows? But in the meantime, you're faced with a dilemma. Like, do you shut down those services or do you take the risk and keep them open knowing that you've got a pretty big security hole inside your cluster? So that's where the concept of mitigation comes in. So the mitig- the concept of mitigation is that once you've identified a security hole, can you put in place controls that temporarily maybe block or quarantine a specific service or container or, or microservice that's been identified as questionable until you have an opportunity to get a permanent fix? Uh, that's mitigation. And second, can you automate the mitigation? Can the system automatically uh, propose Uh, controls for you to quarantine that specific container in question without you having to manually go configure? And then can you test it by staging it, right? Can you stage it and just watch the traffic flow and say, has this thing really been quarantined or not? And then promote it to production, right? So applying a lot of the software engineering principles to security where uh, think about it like a CI CD system, but you're doing this during operations and you're automatically not only detecting these, you're trying to figure out the blast radius, then you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, how do you apply mitigating controls? You have the system propose what the mitigating controls could be. You test those mitigating controls by putting it in staging. If you're satisfied, dive with that by visual inspection through observability. You promote that to production. Uh, a lot of this is 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 ripe for innovation over, over the next uh, decade. So software engineering principles apply here uh, to the management of, for instance, inference models, uh, the mitigation controls that you're uh, putting in place, and really the decision-making that you have to do. Who are these teams that you're seeing do this work? Yeah, so the, the teams really are, you know, anyone managing security operations are really the teams doing all this heavy work. And, and just to kind of maybe build on the first part of your question there for a second, Alex, uh, you know, in terms of applying software engineering principles to security, in fact, I'd go so far to the extent to say that, honestly, that is the only way we have any hope of being able to secure these cloud native applications. Because when you think about why the traditional security models like firewalls are failing, they were all hard-coded, right? They were saying, hey, this specific IP address, you let traffic in. This specific IP address, you you don't let traffic in. So those are examples of hard-coded rules. And there are customers with, I'm not exaggerating, tens of thousands of these rules. And they're afraid to deprecate any of those rules because they don't know what's going to break because some of those rules were configured 10 years ago, right? And so the modern way of handling security is to treat it like software and you assign labels to workloads and you say these workloads are red workloads, these workloads are blue or these are pink. Reds can talk to blues and blues cannot talk to pinks. And then if you need to change some of the rules, you're just changing the software or the rules around that and everything gets reconfigured. Or if you introduce a new workload, you say this workload, you tag it as blues or reds or pinks or a combination of that, and they inherit all the rules. So, I mean, thematically, you can see how easy uh, some of this is once you start to apply the principles of software engineering to security. Hmm. Hmm. So what is the level of seniority on these teams that you're seeing really adopting these technologies? And like, how do you see those teams um, being composed? Who are the people on these teams? But you, you talked about security op- security operations people. Is, is that the whole team or is it is it something different or or what? 
So it's a little bit of a hybrid, but the, the, the first part of your question in terms of seniority, so, so one, one thing that's interesting is that uh, a lot of this adoption and a lot of the innovation and the thought leadership is happening uh, bottom up, right? It's not being driven top down. So uh, you may have someone without any fancy title, but they have the vision and they know how to do this and they're really driving it. They're getting the rest of the organization to adopt it. So this has very little correlation to someone having uh, fairly senior titles. The second part of the question is, it's, it's very cross-functional in nature, and that mirrors how the software for microservices and cloud native is getting deployed. It's a combination of developers. Uh, it's a combination of some someone who has responsibility for handling the platform. They may have different titles, uh, and it depends on the size of the organization. Definitely someone in the security organization and someone inside uh, the DevOps team. Now, I've listed four roles, but it's not unusual in smaller companies Maybe all these four roles are rolled into a single person, and she's handling all these roles, right? So that's very possible. But as you as you get into larger organizations, each of the roles I talked about, maybe there's a whole team behind that. But they have to work together to pull this off. They can't work in silos. What's the intersection of what we're talking about with uh, these software engineering principles and how they apply to for instance, the management of inference models and other of these topics to what we are seeing in the evolution of, of WAFs and protecting the, the network, over the, not just protecting the overall network, but the applications and the services themselves. Yeah, so I, I think if you start to apply, I mean, I mean, think about software engineering. Most of software engineering, you know, programming languages are built on a concept of abstraction. I think... You know, if you look at some of the advances we made in software, I would argue one of the core reasons is better tools and better programming languages. And what does that mean? Better abstraction, because uh, just cognitively, a programmer can do more things because a lot of the complexity is hidden from the programmer. You know, you don't have to worry about the registers and the bits and the bytes. You're operating at a different level of abstraction, right? So that's how in the last two to three decades, you know, our, our, the, the software engineers today are so much more productive compared to like a decade or two ago because of that level of, level of abstraction. So the concept is very similar, I think, in cloud native security that you bring in that level of abstraction and you start to, as a simple example, you start to assign labels and identity to workloads and then you start to configure rules that that allow you to dictate, dictate the behavior of these workloads, what they can and cannot do. So what that takes away is it takes away the physical dependency on where does that workload live, right? It's no longer attached to an IP address, a particular system, a particular infrastructure. It really doesn't matter, right? And when you need to change the rules, you probably need to just go change one rule instead of going and changing 53 different hard-coded, uh, you know, points of reference uh, to a specific IP address, right? So that's a very simple example of, of, of what I'm talking about. And some of the inference I talked about is really built on top of, or is layered on top of that once you start to baseline the data of how workloads, blue workloads have been talking to red workloads for the last 23 days, and suddenly you see a difference in how those two types of workloads are communicating with each other, or some of those workloads start to make some calls out to the internet that you have not seen in the past 23 days, it starts to bring up, bring up a question of why. Why are the blue workloads behaving differently, right? Because you now have data from 23 days that tells you they're supposed to behave in a different way. Uh, and then it gives you the ability to probe deeper through signals from process behavior, file system behavior, system call behavior, and then start to narrow down and get to what could be different and what could be the source of the problem. And then the rest of what I talked about. So if you've identified the problem, then what do you do about it from a mitigation perspective before you wait for a final remediation that could take weeks or months? Can the system 
tell you automatically what rules and what policies, security policies to configure and allow you to test them out through staging and then you promote them into production. That, that entire workflow. Uh, so all, all those, I'd say, I'd say are, are, are principles in some form or shape we borrowed from software engineering. So that's the beauty of it, right? We don't need to reinvent a lot of these things. We can actually dip into the rich history in the repository of software engineering practices. That's a really fascinating topic. I could talk about it for a while. You know, I'm particularly interested in uh, the uh, ramifications for uh, how this may positively affect an organization. So if you can start seeing those calls out to the internet, you know that you can start tracing those calls to see you know, to learn more, really. And that goes them way beyond your network itself, but also into the extended network and the extended supply chain, really. And uh, that seems to be a, a kickoff for another conversation, another time. But I want to thank you very much, Don. It's been a it's been a real interesting discussion. I always enjoy getting into the teams and how they're working, because I think you learn a lot through the work that they're doing, because they're the ones who are really working on the on the projects. So thank you for that perspective. Absolutely. No, thank you. And we learn a lot from our customers and working with them. So I completely agree with you. Alex, has been fun. Thank you so much for the time. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.